without further ado, I'd like to call back up Dan Martell. Yes. Dahani Jones. Jamie Wong. And you haven't heard him speak yet. He'll be speaking tomorrow. But Miha Baldwin. Yeah, Miha. All right. Come on up. Are you stable? Come on down. All right. I'm scared. <laughs> You can do this. This is going to be great. All right, so how this is going to work, though, we're going to take questions from the audience, uh, same as it's been, but don't ask a specific question to just one person. This should be a question that everyone should be able to answer. So uh, anything that you've been wondering, or this is a chance to interact with some people uh, who've inspired us so far today and, and who will tomorrow. So feel free to ask anything that can be answered by the collective group. Uh, yes, OK, very good. Kicking it off. Okay. Um, well, it seems like a lot of you have worked on a lot of different projects and, you know, kind of serial entrepreneurs. So I'm wondering, as you're scaling the current companies that you're growing, how do you determine between what you could do and what you actually should focus on? Good question. Don't start with me. <laughs> Don't start. Uh, I, I think uh, you, as you take your business through its different iterations, it's always important to stay true to your mission and vision statement and reassess. Um, and when you can reassess and you reapply mission and vision, then you can kind of pivot the business towards that, um, towards that mindset. But if you're, not, if you're not adjusting your mission and vision statement, then you need to stay on that same course. Um, I would say for us it's very... Um Um, for us, it's very metric driven. So whatever our core growth metric is, um, we, fo we focus on that. And if something is going to make that number go up, uh, we do it. And if it's not, then we don't do it. And if we don't know, we'll weigh them all what's, mo what's most uh, probable. So, um, and a lot of it is guessing at first. But there are certain things we've figured out that actually really work and we'll move that number up. And so we'll focus on that. My, my, I guess my mine is similar to both uh, answers, but I think the one that I'm, I, I like kind of using the, I don't know if I'm supposed to swear, but the fuck yeah kind of decision. Like when I'm looking at things I could do, I always try to go for the one I'm most passionate about, which is aligning with the vision. But you know, I, I feel like a lot of times entrepreneurs actually know the answer and their gut's telling them they're just not uh, willing to kind of go with that. So I just go with the one that makes me most excited and it turns out to usually work out really well. The, for me, the idea is that you need to work backwards. So you start with what you want to accomplish, and then you lay out the steps that allow you to get there. And if for some reason those steps are too many, or there's clearly a, a roadblock somewhere in the middle of that, then you figure out how to either get around it, adjust it, or go in a different direction. The, the thing that most people forget is that if you're doing a startup, you're building a business. And a business has to be of certain size, depending upon what your desires are for that business. If it's a venture back business, it needs to at some point get to $100 million. If it's a, your bootstrapping business, maybe it's OK at 10 or 20 million. And you just need to figure out what that is and then work yourself backwards. Um, I, I do think that sometimes we get ca caught in the, the fuck yeah or the passion. And then we don't understand why it's not progressing and why the world hurts so bad. And, and we can't get past it because we're passionate about it. It should fucking work, right? And then it doesn't, and we don't know why. And, and at some point, you do have to take a step back and be purely logical about the direction in which you're going. Sorry. All right. Great question. Great answers. Yes. I guess uh, the, the four of you, are, I think at least three of you, are not from our region here. Um, and I certainly have appreciated hearing everything you have to say today. I would like to ask you to reflect on, on our last speaker and um, maybe what does that sound like to you? It was kind of a rah-rah for the Midwest and I think we, a lot of us agree with what we heard. But I'm curious to know, what does that sound like to you? Is that, a, oh, well, that's their thing? Or uh, do you have anything to add from, from your perspective to that last your, talk? Your name is? My name is Bill. Can we just ask people to say their name? Yeah, my name cool. is Bill Mullins and uh, I'm a local. Cool. Aging entrepreneur here. Thanks, Bill. Um, I, my, here's my two cents. I come from a town of 100,000 people. I built a company there and then went to the valley and kind of saw that crazy world. And now I'm building Clarity back home. And you know, the one thing that fucking pisses me off about the media is they always ask, 
how do we build the next Silicon Valley? How do we be the next whatever city? And my response has always been, let's stop trying to be the best, you know, the next Silicon Valley, and let's try to be the best Kansas City. Because I think that's the best thing we could all ever do, is just try to figure out what we're great at and be the best at that. I can't follow it up. You guys clapped at him. <laughs> Not going to be like, Omaha, Kansas City, yay. Um, I think that, that the one thing that a great entrepreneur does is that they listen to their business, and their business tells you what it needs. And sometimes that means it needs to be in Omaha or be in Kansas City, and sometimes it means that it needs to be in New York. And we as a community can't look at somebody's decision to leave a region as being a traitor. And we can't look at somebody's decision to stay as being um, altruistic. At the end of the day, we're building businesses, and the business is what has to matter the most. Now, in order to build a community, it's important to stay and participate in that community. And what I think is actually the worst thing that happens in, in local communities, and, and I built graphically in Boulder um, as an example, and then we've now moved to California um, for multitudes of reasons, but, uh, but that people build companies in the area and they complain about how there's no support and then they don't support the other people in the region. I'm just gonna put my head down, I'm just gonna work. Right? They never stop for a minute and say, you know what, I'm gonna take my 20% of my day and instead of hacking, I'm gonna go to three other entrepreneurs and say, what can I do to help? Or I'm gonna get donuts on Saturday and just chat. Um, and that's the biggest negative that happens in a region is that people don't reach out. But we can't look at somebody leaving or somebody deciding to stay as if there is some other reason behind it other than what the business needs. Um, and beyond that, the most important thing to do is participate. I mean, I live in, I live in Cincinnati. Uh, is mine on? I don't think so. Oh, I live in Cincinnati. So I'm in a sort of similar situation that Kansas City is. And I've decided to stay there because I do believe that there are those talented individuals, there are those resources, and then as we kind of functionally collaborate together, we can go out and source those individuals that can come, therefore, and, and build Cincy. And we're quite fortunate because Procter & Gamble is in the background. We have Centrifuge that's building um, a fund to fund. We have the Brandery that's curating different uh, businesses. Um, and, and some of the companies have to, have to go. And then the response, you know, Brandery started, and you know they had a couple different companies that were funded, and then all of a sudden they had to go real close to the VCs. So, you know they had to move to you know to San Francisco. They had to move to Boulder. They had to move to New York. They had to move all over the place. But those are the same people that are going to build their business, and then, like Mike said, for the sake of the business, and then come back and reinvest in the city. Um, but then the city itself had to respond to that as well. And the city said, "Look, we're going to create a fund to fund in order to get more." VCs to move there and apply capital towards their, towards their, their fund and in order to keep the businesses so they can actually be near in the actual city of Cincinnati. So I think it's one, the responsibility of the people, uh, two, it's the responsibility of the businesses, and, and three, um, it's just an overall mindset and attitude adjustment and saying, look, our city is growing to this size, we want to extend the growth, we want to uh, create uh, more opportunity, let those companies go, but make sure we have an overall plan in order to get them back. How many people here know what Dahani is talking about in the fund of funds that Cincy is doing? They put $60 million up, $80, $80 million up, my bad, and uh, they put $80 million up to fund alongside other venture companies, other venture uh, businesses, firms, to invest in local business. And, and there's at least three to four companies that I know are in the region that got funding specifically because that fund existed. So it is a great example of the city itself reaching back out to help. And then, and then in the same light, funds that were located to add more capital to them, but then also VCs that were located on the coast in order for them to relocate or to have someone open up an office in the yeah. city of Cincinnati for them to be able to do the same type of thing. Um, so now you have different VCs, private equity firms that are able to aggregate themselves in the city of Cincinnati. And one of the things that they offer is we'll introduce you, right? We'll fast track some of these businesses um, within the core community of the brand, uh, brand hub that Cincinnati is um, in order for them to have 
a large level of growth trajectory because in the end you want your businesses to grow. So you have to rely on those relationships. And if those relationships are good and the capital is there, then you have a good business. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as, as entrepreneurs, it's really our job to use our idiosyncrasies to our advantage and really um, tell a story of what our unique advantage is, why we're the ones to bring this product to market, uh, to build a successful business. And I think as communities, that's also our responsibility. So, uh, for instance, for the community here, really anywhere, what are your strengths and idiosyncrasies and how do you play that collectively to your advantage? And that becomes part of your story, part of your branding, and also a way to really strengthen as a community and include more people. Um, because again, you know, um, just as I'm not going to compete with Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, no other community should try to compete directly in that way with Silicon Valley, but instead present something, something different and something better. Great. Yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is uh, Toby Rush. First, thanks for coming out to, to Kansas City and joining us for a while. Um, you know, a question I hear get asked a lot, and this is from um, kids in college, this is from uh, people just wanting to be a first-time entrepreneur or seasoned entrepreneurs who exit a company and then they, they get done with it, like, I want to do it again, but I don't know where to start. Like, what's the idea? How do I find the next thing? Um, I'm just curious from you guys, when you, when you uh, whether yourselves or others, how do people go about finding the next idea, finding the, the next thing they can dive into? I think for most entrepreneurs, at some point they're sitting under a tree and an apple falls on their head. I, I think that in reality, um, it is something that has just bugged you forever. Uh, my first... Uh, business that I ever started. I was nine years old and I convinced everybody in the neighborhood to get together and I ran uh, a lawn mowing ring where I had them all do the work and give me the money because my mom wouldn't pay for me to go to the movies and I wanted to go see some goddamn movies and so I made sure that it happened, right? And I think that at the end of the day it's always that. Now, it could be something gigantic, right? It could be building Facebook, right? Or it could be being able to go see a movie, but it all begins from that same feeling of, I can't believe this doesn't exist, or I hate the fact that this exists, and I'm going to change that. Um, one of my favorite lines that I've ever heard is, uh, everybody wants to change the world, right? Entrepreneurs are just willing to fail at it. Mm -hmm. And and um, and that's the difference. That's where it all comes from, right? Something has to exchange. Um, yeah, I would just say, you know, real world problems. Think about um, how you're going to execute on that and what the product is really should be just a function of the solution, the solution to the problem. Um, so when people start off before they have an idea, they already are wireframing something, um, then you know that's probably not the best way to go about it. Yeah, I, I'd say it's identifying a problem in the marketplace and then come, coming up with your solution. I mean, something simple as like the toothpick with the two grooves that are cut out, reason why you just break it off and now you put like on top like a chopstick, I mean, that's genius, <laughs> you know? Um, or it, and most people probably don't even know that's what you're supposed to do. You know the toothpicks with the little grooves on the top? Yeah. You never seen those? Oh, yeah. All right. So the grooves are there, so you break it off. And much like you go to a sushi restaurant, you put your chopstick on top of a rock in order to protect it from being on the table, you're supposed to do that with your toothpick. Genius, <laughs> right? No, that's how, you know, it's, it's identifying the, the issues or anything to make people more lazy. That's what, like another really good idea. Um, I mean, just like you don't want to hold your suitcase, so you put wheels on the bottom. You just you know, you roll it, so you don't have to. So it's, under, uh, it's understanding where people need different things, um, understanding what, um, what can help people. And it's also, for me, what I, I always do is just kind of identify um, things that are within my own core competency, within the sports realm, within the fashion realm, and say, you know, this is something that I could tweak, adjust to make it a little bit more my own and put my signature on it, and that is sort of uh, where my entrepreneurial mindset goes. Um, you know, it's just anything that can really help, if you will, um, and, and, and identifying exactly what's missing. So, I mean, same, same answer. The, um you know, I got a call on Clarity from uh, a guy in Africa one time, and he, and he asked me that question, like, how do you, you know, you've had success in business, how do you come up with good ideas? And it kind of caught me off guard, because, like, if anything, I think everybody on the stage has too many ideas, and they have to edit, right? Like, every day we go through life going, that sucks, that sucks, I would fix that, I can't believe this company runs that way. Um, 
but that's where I realized that if all, all you do is you go throughout your day. See, entrepreneurs are hypersensitive to the friction, right? So if you just go throughout your day and start writing all those moments where you've experienced challenges or friction or annoyance, I mean, everything from having to split a bill at a table amongst your friends or whatever. Um, and then the, the trick is to pick the one that you're most passionate about and do it regardless if anybody thinks it's a good idea. And even if it fails, the, the, the exciting part is you at least solved it for yourself. Right, so that's always the upside. Is if you solve it and you're the only customer, at least your life's better. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the way I look at it. Thanks. Yes. All right. So speaking of real world problems, I got a two parter for y'all. What do, um, to what degree and to what role does sustainability play a role in your startup businesses? And do you all do any work with B corporations, benefit corporations, or are you familiar with them? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the B Corporation thing, um, I've looked into, we are incorporated in Delaware, as um, most tech companies are, and they don't actually have a B Corp um, la certificate there, so we are a C Corp. Um, however, there are a lot of people petitioning to um, make B Corps ubiquitous across all states. Um, that being said, while we're not doing anything official, um, you know, the, the, our, our, the, the name of the company is called Viable, and the idea is really bringing um, economic, social, and environmental viability to places and redistributing wealth in the tourism industry. So that's always been really the core of the mission and the core of what the product is about. So. Um, as far as environmental sustainability, that's something that's very ingrained in our culture, and so that's where we're seeing it, it start. We, while we don't have any specific policies set in place, and we aren't held accountable by our board to um, certain um, impact metrics, we are building a culture among our team um, where we're very conscious of making sure to recycle everything, uh, ordering organic foods for lunch and um, you know not using paper goods in in the office and things like that so at our scale I think that's the best way to go about it <laughs> was that answer? Um, you know we, we try to do our best and do our part in terms of our own personal corporate social responsibility and the, the B Corp we've also looked into as well um, the one thing that we did was actually a pretty big pivot is that we uh, were doing all of our manufacturing overseas in China and now we just recently moved, relocated all of our manufacturing to Oklahoma City. So, um, and as we start to sort of look at the landscape, um, even within manufacturing um, in Oklahoma City, how do, we start, how do we start to incorporate different aspects of the community into um, uh, uh, small market manufacturing and light sewing, if you will, with the bow ties. Um, but it's always a, a constant struggle and also something that we're always looking at, um, whether it's personally or whether it's, uh, you know, via our, our company. Uh, I'll probably answer it a bit uh, unpopularly. Is that a word? Uh, popularly? Close to popularly. Um, so graphically is focused on digital books. So by definition, we're trying to save trees. Um, and the more trees saved, the more money we make, so the happier we are. Um, which is probably an unpopular statement, but it's true. We're, at the end of the day, we're still a business. And I think sustainability and, and those sort of things are decisions that are made either at the personal level that you as a company do on an individually, or if it fits within your business, um, you add to your business. Like Tom Shoes does an amazing job. Warby Parker does an amazing job. It fits within their business model. For certain businesses, it just doesn't fit within their business model. Um, but I do think that uh, at the end of the day, when I say that we're trying to change the world, it means that we are trying to make the world a better place. And part of it is, is that the, the better world has, it, the, play, the world has to be a better place to actually live in. So I think that you, know, you hear things from Jamie talking about buying organic foods to bringing manufacturing back to the US to, to other things you know, that we're trying to do. Each one of those things, while probably isn't under the guise of sustainability, does make the world a better place. And I think that that's important. Um, it is a very much a, a business decision when you, when you interject it into your business. 
again, like a Warby Parker or a, or a Tom Shoes, which I think does an amazing job with that. Yeah, I mean, my so I read a book called Compassionate Capitalism, written by Mark Benioff uh, when I was 20-something, 20 23. And, uh, he had this idea of the 1% solution, so I actually adopted it at Spheric. So every year we donated 1% of our revenues, our resources, and our time to nonprofits. And because we were traveling around and we realized we were you know, burning a lot of resources, we actually bought carbon offsets to try to make up for that. Um, I think that the number one thing you can do to give back is create a successful company and create employment. And then through those actions, you'll have leverage to do things. So. Uh, to me, it's always a secondary thing, first being successful, because if you don't have success, you won't have leverage. Um, and if you can build it in the business model, like Miha was saying, I mean, at Clarity, day one, we offered experts to donate their proceeds to charity. And I meant to tell Scott earlier, but Charity Water is one of the most popular charities. We've raised, I think, close to $14,000 for charity uh, across 192 calls. So really great advice got given, and the right people received the funds, and it was donated. And, I think if it makes sense, you should do it. But I, I'm all about building a great business first and then figuring out how I can use that resource to, to do good. Yes, you've been patiently waiting. OK, uh, my name is Matthew. I'm a local entrepreneur uh, building my second startup. And um, like you guys, uh, I'm passionate about what I do. I love being an entrepreneur. It's, I love the risk. I love the excitement. I love the unknown. Uh, but as we know, passion can be like all-consuming. right? It can really like take over your life. So I'm curious for you guys to speak about life management or life balance. Like, how do you balance the love of work with the love of life and the personal side? You're stealing my talk from tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I can make that a really simple thing: is um, be selfish. Right? It's it's the it's the most um, backwards way of thinking for an entrepreneur but it is the only way to ensure that your life has balance, which is by making it a priority. And balance is defined completely differently by different people. It could be spending time with family. It could be traveling. It could be playing with your dogs. And for us to say that there is a definition for what life work balance is, is asinine and, and just inappropriate, right? And so I think at the end of the day, it's, the answer is simple. It's, it's be selfish. Right? And, and make it the priority so that you're, at the end of the day, happy. Um, and thank you, folks. I don't need to speak tomorrow. But thanks. <laughs> so I'll give you my quick methodology. I mean, so I sucked at it. I was actually, uh, yeah, I just sucked at it. Let's just put it that way. Um, but what I do is I don't, I don't fight the, I love the fact that I get so passionate it, it consumes me. So, so what I do is, you know, let's say there's three pillars, your health, your relationships, and your business. Um, every three to four months, I focus on two and put the other one on maintenance mode so that I can allow myself to you know, get healthier or be super passionate about my business or really focus on my family and you know, my son. And, and I, I, don't, I can't fight it, so I try to kind of like use it. But I think that's one of the superpowers of being an entrepreneur is allowing yourself to be all consumed with those things, no matter what you set your sights on but just know that you should kind of round robin it so that you end up not being really financially successful and lonely as hell. And just, I mean, just to add, because this is like, this is something I'm super passionate about, so I'm sorry. But uh, um, it, we teach entrepreneurs the dumbest shit ever, which is focus on your business, your business, your business, to our own detriment and our own health, when the only thing that drives that business is the founder. And if we're destroying the founder, then we're destroying the company. And that really the only way to generate real life, life work balance is to put yourself first, to figure out something that works for you so that you can be working at an optimal level so your business works at an optimal level. And if you're not doing that, the balance should be you and the business, so the business is running. And if you're not doing that, then you're actually screwing all your employees, and you're screwing all your investors, and you're screwing all your customers, because you're not giving them 100%. You're screwing yourself. And you're screwing yourself. Um, you're going to fuck yourself. I like that. But, uh, um, but, uh, uh, but if, and if all you need is five minutes every day, five minutes to go do something, then you should do it. it it's your responsibility. Sorry, I get passionate about this, because I just see so many people fighting it. And, and you know, um, you know, we have friends that have died because of it. Literally, have committed suicide because of it. And and I can't speak 
more loudly about anything, but just be selfish. You have to be. Sorry. Sorry guys. Uh, I think I've kind of found a way to merge them all together. And, you know, I talked earlier about kind of doing a TV show at the same time I was playing football. Um, you have to find aspects that you're passionate about that allow you to live your life um, and things of your life that allow you to be passionate about. Um, I'm selfish when I kind of take a couple moments to myself, but most of the time I'm selfless because I'm trying to work towards or um, help others. So it's kind of a little bit of a balance, and I don't think everybody has the ultimate solution in order to, or, or they've solved it, if you will. I mean, you know, there was a soothsayer that told me one day, he said, you know what, Donnie, you need to walk in the grass barefoot. That'll help you ease the pain of working too hard. I was like, all right. So I tried it for a little bit, and it worked. Uh, but then you kind of go back to your regular pattern of things. Um, but I will tell you this, and, and kind of this relates to different businesses that I have. Um, and the, the, this story kind of makes sense across all the things I do. But when I was doing the Travel Channel show, granted, this wasn't an entrepreneurial venture. This was a host adventure, if you will. Um, maybe my football was entrepreneurial venture. That's what I talked about before. But anyways, during the three years that I, uh, I played on Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Bengals for four years, the first year, I just kind of put my head down and played the game. And this is at the same time that the other show was in development. So going into the net, my last three years, or my three-year contract that I had at Cincinnati, in the middle of those three years, I did the show. The show would kind of go during my off-season. So that's how I was able to do it. Um, I was the leading tackler on the team. Um, I had the the highest percentage of success on the field, and I never missed a game, and I never was injured, um, and, you know, I was player of the year at the same, you know, so I was doing all of that in that three-year period of time because I was able to weave what I was passionate into sort of my life. The travel actually supported my love of the game, and the game supported my love of travel. Um, so. I don't know if I'm, I hope I'm answering your question in terms of if you're able to weave those together, you're able to find a great balance and they'll both support one another. You just have to be able to find which are the two balance. You know, for me right now, I kind of operate in the trifecta um, where I'm, if I'm on TV uh, rocking one of my bow ties, um, then I'm also talking to a, a potential client that might be working with my creative agencies. Um, and then while I'm talking to the, to the different clients, um, or I'm at a specific nonprofit event with, with working with bow ties, that also could be TV. So it's kind of like finding a, a good balance where it's able to seamlessly weave into your life and also be a part of your passion. I have no idea, so uh, let me know if you figure it out. <laughs> All right, we'll go here. Uh, you three guys will be the last three questions. Yeah, just one really quick question. Um, what would each of you say would be a crucial like time management technique that you each use in a day-to-day? -day? Because it sounds like everybody's very busy. And uh, and how does that work for you? And what's your name? Oh, I'm Chris. Thanks, Chris. Hi. The, the best time management thing I can tell you is find other people. You know, find your lieutenants. Delegate. That's the best time management technique. Because as an entrepreneur, you want to do everything by yourself, so you have no sense of time management. Um, it's just, you, just, you believe that nothing can be done without you doing it. So it's kind of inherent that we kind of micromanage just a little bit. Um, but at the same time, you can delegate to someone that you can actually trust, where you can give them full autonomy to go do that while watching them just a little bit. Um, that's the best time management that I've found. Um, this has worked for me is just, um, email time, check in the morning and check at night, and if you can resist, and if it's possible to not check your email while you're working and during meetings and out at coffee, um, you find that you actually suddenly have more hours in your day. 
remember that meetings are about when things end and not when things start. So set up your meetings to remember that that's when you need to stop something and just stop it and then move on to the next thing. And then you'll find that your day just gets more ordered as, as your day progresses. So um, I don't look at meetings as to remind me when I need to be somewhere. And they always remind me when I need to leave. So I, I subscribe to the big rocks concept. Like, I just feel a lot of times people can stay busy but actually get nothing done. So I always start off writing out the three things I want to get done that are material impact to the business or to my family or to my health and make sure I do those first. And everything else, if it doesn't get done, I don't give a shit. Like, you really, you have to be selfish and focus on the things that are actually going to move your goals forward, not just get busy, because that's easy. Thank you. Yes. Um, I didn't come up with this question. I'm stealing it from a good friend of mine from last year. <laughs> it's honest. Um, what's your guys' biggest fuck up? I mean, it's, it's not something that we're necessarily going to read or we can Google, but like, what is the one thing that maybe you mishandled or you personally take responsibility for that you can share with all of us uh, and maybe learn from? I'll, I'll tell my, my name. Sorry, my name's Jordan. Hey, Jordan. Thanks for the nice. question. Um, Biggest fuck up lately was when I started uh, Clarity, I, um, I got really excited, super passionate, like couldn't sleep. It was like four in the morning. And I just decided I got to start telling people because I wanted to know if like, is this actually a good idea or it's just me, which happens a lot. I'm sure entrepreneurs have had that moment. So I, I email a guy that if, I'm not going to mention his name because it's absolutely embarrassing, but he's, he's up there with like the Bill Gates and the uh, Steve Jobs of the world. Uh, he was an investor in another uh, one of my companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, my email was like, can we talk with my phone number? And he took it as urgency. So he calls me, he like leaves dinner, calls me, and I'm like, hey, I'm working on this new idea. And he's like, did we really need to talk right now? And I was like, uh, no, no, not really. He's like, oh, OK. Um, and then he gave me some polite feedback. And I got an email from him two weeks later, essentially saying, like, I really thought that was inappropriate. And he was right. And I. I don't know. I'll never forget that lesson. He was really nice about it. But you really need to kind of figure out what. It's almost like when you say things or you get excited, you got to kind of make sure you edit um, because you can sometimes overstep, especially with advisors, with investors, with good friends. You might, you might ask for something that you think is, at the time, not a big deal. And you don't realize how much you're asking. And if, and if you drop the ball, it's, it's really embarrassing. So that was a great lesson that I'll, I'll never do for the rest of my life. But luckily, I had a, a good guy on the other end. Uh, um, you asked for a private fuck up. And most of my fuck ups have been pretty public, or I've written about them. <laughs> he, he writes about so, uh, you can't Google. Yeah, that you can't Google. That's tough for me. Um, I think that I Until think tomorrow, that, when people yeah, can Google that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that the biggest mistakes that I've made in my life have centered around um, knowing that somebody else needed help and then not helping them. I think, I think every single time when I've had an inkling that I should have just pulled somebody aside and had a conversation um, and I didn't do it because I was busy or whatever, that it, it led to either something very detrimental in their life or it led to a missed opportunity in my life. And, and it's one of the reasons why um, I end every conversation I have with, how can I help you? And it's one of the reasons why I, um, and I mean that, by the way. I don't just say it. Um, and it's also why I really, really try to make sure that if somebody clearly needs help, that I'm available. Um, and it's not because I'm altruistic, and it's not because I'm trying to be some good guy, right? It's just that's the way the world works. And, I, and if I want other people to be that way, I need to be that way too. Um, but I would say that my biggest non googleable googleable uh, <laughs> That's not a word. Google-ly, google Googlicious um, uh, fuck-ups have been centered around times when um, I should have been there and I wasn't. I'd say, um, you know, similar to what you're talking about in terms of manage, managing relationships. Uh, I think that's the biggest, biggest, you know, uh, error of my, of my time in terms of, you know, having a solid relationship and, and passing that off to someone 
that didn't, that mismanaged it, um, and then lo you know losing a relationship because of it. Um, you know, kind of when you're in the you know whether you're in the creative world or whether you're in the um, clothing world, you know you're able to do certain things because certain people have provided you an opportunity and you cannot squander that relationship and not manage it and pass it off to someone. Now, if you have to sort of, I mean, scheduling is one thing, but when they're personal relationships and you're supposed to maintain a certain level of connectivity and you allow other people to do that for you and um, they don't carry out um, or they don't maintain the relationship as you would because they're not you, um, that can put you in a precarious situation. You can lose potential clients, you can lose potential relationships, or someone can, uh, someone can actually create a perception of you that's really not you. Um, yeah, also along the relationship human line, which is interesting, that's where we all make our mistakes up here. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, when, when you're super passionate and have all this energy and you want to move everything forward really quickly, um, the default is to just everything as fast as you fucking can. And there's one area in building a startup where that really should not apply, and that's hiring and choosing who you're working with. Do not speed through that. Do not rush through that. That's definitely my, been my biggest fuck up. Um, you know, as they say, hire slow, fire fast, and that's that's really true. And you have to think about that. And that and that applies broadly. That is everyone from who you're partnering with to who your banker is going to be to your accountant, every person who you're working with. Um, if you're a founder, you're essentially hiring them, and you really, really need to go through as much of a vetting process as you possibly can, be as slow and diligent as you possibly can. So that's certainly um, where I've made my biggest mistakes. And you know, you take one step forward, and then you're taking ten steps back when you mess that up. Uh, there is um, what well, it says. Uh, there, it's like 17 times for you to build a relationship. You have to be in front of someone 17 times. There's some large Double it's, digit uh, number to for be, every bad relation, every bad move, it takes 17 good ones to overcome it. Right. So, yeah. and the other way to look at that is 17 times for you to build a relationship in person, and it only takes one time to destroy that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. Hi, my name is Landon Young, and I'm a scholar at the Kaufman Foundation. Um, I'm from Indiana originally, and uh, I'm interested in youth entrepreneurship, so kind of maybe on a happier note. Um, I talked with Tim Rowe at the CIC in Boston, uh, and he said, uh, the companies that are created that are economic generators come from wonder keen individuals, exceptional ones, uh, Gates, Jobs, Zuckerberg. These people are generally successful at a very young age. These are the companies that move the economy. And um, that can be argued either way. But I think it is true that they generally are exceptional at a young age, and we've seen that with the presenters today, showing pictures of them when they were young. Um, how can we uh, identify and then uh, lift up those young potential entrepreneurs like you were when you were young? So, uh, so now you're killing my, my talk from next week. But uh, uh, my, uh, my big idea that I want to do post graphically is start a high school for entrepreneurs. And not to teach entrepreneurship, but I believe strongly that entrepreneurs are born, not made. And it just like a basketball player, a football player needs to have training, entrepreneurs need it as well. Um, the reason why VCs invest serially in a single entrepreneur is not because they expect that entrepreneur to continually be good. It's because they'll be great once. Right? And the reason why they invest in young entrepreneurs is because it gives them more shots at goal over the, over the course of their life. Right? So if I invest in a 25-year-old who does a company every three to four years, by the time they hit 35 to 40, they're going to nail one. And um, so I think that the best way to, uh, to be supportive of, of young entrepreneurship is, um, is to go outside of the current educational system to create literally team-like things. Like, 
you know, I'm sure Dahani was recognized early age that you're going to be a good football player and, and got extra opportunity to go play ball. Like, I was a lacrosse player, right? I got extra um, information, you know, extra time and stuff around the lacrosse. We got to do the same thing with, with potential entrepreneurs. Um, and that's by giving them, looking at the kid who at eight years old is mowing all the lawns and, and, and trying to create the guy that was, you know, uh, my favorite story is, is Gary Vaynerchuk who would steal the flowers off of the front lawn and then go sell it back to you, right? Like, like those are the people that, that we need to identify at an early age. And, and I think that if we can identify, you know, the little hoodlums that turn into something big, then all of a sudden these gigantic companies start getting built. Um, you know, there was just a company sold by a 17-year-old. Um, there's a 15-year-old that's halfway to curing something amazing. Like, like if you look at the ages between 14 and 18, which are you know high school years, there's amazing things being created by kids of that age period. But yet, we as adults go finish high school and then we'll talk. So, so I think that we have to do is take everything that we've been doing with everybody in this room and put it to the 12-year-olds. Right, start it early at the nine-year-olds and, and get them involved. Like we shouldn't, we shouldn't disallow um, a nine-year-old from joining Toastmasters to learn how to speak properly. Right? We should be we should be encouraging kids at an earlier age. Sorry. Damn. Uh, here's what I do uh, when I meet kids like that that Miha was talking about. I was one of them. I was actually a bit of a shithead growing up, so nobody would have said that I had. You know, whatever. Like they, they did. My dad always said, "I can't wait till you find something you're passionate about that isn't illegal." Um, <laughs> that'll be good. So uh, when I meet these kids, I actually ask them if they have a cell phone, and I put my number in their phone, and I say, "Someday you're gonna have to talk to somebody. Call me. Like seriously, I know you. You don't think I'll answer, but you'd be surprised how little phone calls I get throughout the day, and and I'll answer because." I, as, as I said in my talk, I just know how powerful that is to have somebody that's had some level of success that you can be around and call when everybody else is telling you that your idea is crazy or stupid or you're not sure if you should go to college or start your business or whatever. I'm not saying I'll have the answer, but at least I'll take the call. And that's just like my way. And I do that. I freak people out. I'm like, get a cell phone. I take it, put my number in. I said, that's my cell. Text me if you want. I don't care. But just making your, I think as entrepreneurs, if you had any success, the best thing we could do is is, is encourage them to start, right? And to know that it's not the first or second company that's gonna win. Like my first two were fucking creators, like lost money. And if I would have stopped, because everybody else you know, didn't believe in it, that I would never done what I've done. So I, I always tell entrepreneurs, like, especially the young ones, like start today to get it out of the way, because the first one's gonna probably be a, a big, big failure. Mm -hmm. And that's okay, because I'll be excited for the next one for you. When I sold my first company, my grandmother said, uh, I'm glad you sold the company because it was 50-50 on whether you would have ended up in jail. So, uh, which was nice. I said, thanks, Grandma. I'm not buying you shit. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think it's being, I think it's being open and I think it's being available to the young entrepreneurs because they'll find you. Um, and when they find you, be available to talk to them. Be available to offer them advice and uh, understanding. And I, you know, I love the idea of the entrepreneurial school. I think that's fantastic. And, uh, you know, currently I'm working with the University of Michigan. Um, as I said, the greatest university in the entire world. Um, we have more Fortune 500. Uh, <laughs> just, um, you know, but I'm working with the, at the University of Michigan to uh, develop an entrepreneurship program that works in conjunction with the university. And, uh, you know, it's, it's those bright young minds that maybe just need a, a little bit here and there. Um, and, it, and it's really amazing how, how much an, an 18 year old or even a 12 year old or 14 year olds, you know, they'll take $5 and they'll make it $500. You know, we have a problem, you know, like we're like, oh, what am I supposed to do with $5? I need $50,000, right? They'll work tireless hours trying to convert that, you know, 500%, you know, and, and, and for us, we need that much more. So it's about, it's, it's, it's about um, being accessible, um, uh, being open and available to young people, and uh, giving them hope, and I think you know, putting the you know phone phone number in the cell phone, but social media, right? They tweet at you, tweet them, tweet them back. Um, you know, develop a certain level of connectivity with the youth because we were there once. It's funny, you guys all talk about having different jobs. I mean, my first job was picking up sticks. Okay. I charged someone to pick their sticks up in the yard, then clean gutters, then change light bulbs, then wash cars. 
Um, I was the best pizza delivery boy that anybody had ever seen. I took like 10 pizzas at one time. Um, but we've all had that, you know, but someone's gave us that opportunity and we need to be able to give that back. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, I think in general, all of us really cultivating a, a culture that um, is pro-risk and not so risk averse, because I think that's what held me back from starting. I, I've always been an entrepreneur, um, and I would have started my first company a lot younger had I not felt that pressure to have stability and and degrees. I mean, I was definitely, I was like five-year-old going and stealing lemons from the neighbor's garden and then selling it back to the neighbor and all the other neighbors um, and had that impulse. So I think, you know, to celebrate that um, and, and to go, you know, to unlikely communities, you know, I'm, I'm going back to my college, which is a liberal arts college. Nobody really thinks about entrepreneurship and that is something that should be on their radar and they should have mentors, role models, and know that this is something that's um, extremely viable to do. So lesson learned, if you shoplifted or stole as a kid, you have a bright future? <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a spot in entrepreneurial high school. <laughs> yes, fantastic. All right, real quick, because we're, our day is winding we'll, down we'll here. We'll answer it in less than 10 words, promise. Great. <laughs> All right, my name is Jacob McDaniel. Blue. I'm a Green. Go. freelance designer and developer and entrepreneur here in Kansas City. What's the worst job you guys have ever had? <laughs> oh, I can tell you that 100%. Um, when I was living in Colorado, uh, my first job was with a uh, video professor. Um, if you guys remember, it was a little CDs mm -hmm. that, uh, try my product. It's right? a lot of words. Oh, sorry. Video professor. <laughs> video professor. Sucked. Dude was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I was under building, digging dirt, like two foot crawl space for two weeks. That sucked. <laughs> Picking up sticks. <laughs> um, serving pizza in college. All right. Well, we're not going to end on that note. We're going to end on this has been a great first day. What is one thing that you've learned here today? Uh, I'll, I'll just say real quick. I, I think the one thing I've learned is uh, everybody wants community. And second thing is people need to stop uh, saying they want it and just do it themselves. Miha said it, like, everybody wants it. Mm -hmm. we all, we're all we all responsible to create for ourselves. Yep. Uh, great entrepreneurs are not location specific, um, but many entrepreneurs are location apologetic. And we just shouldn't apologize for what we don't have. We should dominate what we do. Yeah. yeah. Great entrepreneurs know how to do the Harlem Shake. <laughs> um, something is happening here, and I'm excited to see what it is. Yeah. All right. Let's give it up for our speakers and for all of you. Something is happening here in Kansas City.